questions. Um, and welcome, welcome to One Workplace, to our event on well-being to learning. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our moderator, Marana Medved, and she will introduce our panelists today. Can you hear me, Peter? No? Uh, maybe, the, maybe I just need to speak up a little bit. Okay. Is that, that might help. Is that better? Can you, short. can you hear me better now? Okay, just not used to using a microphone. Sorry about that. Um, Marana is the Director of Interiors at Artique Art and Architecture, an educational art architectural firm and design instructor at San Jose State University and West Valley College. She strives to use design to promote the health and wellness of building occupants and cultivate well-being through built environments. I got to know Marana through her team's Wonder Grant research on building community and learning environments. For its research, the Artique team, some of which are here today, why don't you raise your hand, let me see. Proud, Allison and Gayatri, thank you. Uh, shared resources and insights on how built environments can support the creation of a sense of community and well-being in learning environments through evidence-based interventions and strategies all in a, a really approachable format that will allow incorporation in any project, no matter the budget, schedule, or scale. They even created a community through design website. And for those of you um, who don't know about the Wonder Grant, just feel free to reach out to myself or Dave Bryant, our VP, uh, CCB, who's here today, or any, any of our team. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Marana. Thank you, Josh. Welcome, everybody. How is everybody today? Um, let's dive right in. So we're going to get started. I would like to introduce our fabulous panel tonight, uh, starting with Dr. Peter Parenti. He's the Vice President of Tri Group Incorporated. And first and foremost, he's an educator. He served as a California credential teacher, elementary and middle school principal, program coordinator, and director of curriculum and instruction and he was also Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services. So, very qualified person for this panel. And then... Ooh, let's give it a little extra. I know, yeah, come on. Come on Design people, come Show on. Show a little oh. bit of love. And by the way, why is nobody in the front row? It's not a table. We want... <laughs> I have some students in here. Students, take the front row, please. And next, uh, we have Anna Harrison, who is founder of Designing Schools with Nature, and she's also associate faculty in interior design at West Valley College. And Anna is accredited educational facilities planner. She's a biophilic designer and sustainable design educator. And next. And next, we have the fabulous Dr. Tamil Gil Gil Gilkerson. Of course, I was going to do that. Uh, I choked up because it's going to be hard to do a quick introduction for Dr. Gilkerson. She is currently the president of Evergreen Valley College. She's the former president of Laney College. She's the first diversity, inclusion, and innovation officer of Contra Costa Community College District. She's also a leader in a number of statewide efforts that address students' basic needs support undocumented and mixed status students and improve the quality and delivery of distance education and many, 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 many more things. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank you. And to round up our panel, we have Paul Nadeau, Director of Facilities Planning and Management at Gilroy Unified School District. And Paul here works with staff, students, and architectural design teams, which we have few of in a house, on learning environment projects. Please welcome our panel. And what we're going to do next, we're going to talk about well being. But in order to talk about well being, we want to make sure that everybody is feeling a sense of well being right now. So we're going to start by taking a mindful pause. And uh, you holding some food or drinks, if you can put them down for a moment. Nobody's going to go around and take them away. And I'd like to ask everybody to close their eyes and take a deep breath. And imagine yourself in a place that fosters your feeling of well-being. 
Where would you go to feel well in this moment? Everybody got a spot? What can you see? Look around. What can you touch? What are you feeling? Can you hear anything? How about a smell anything? Any tastes? Any chocolate in your place of well-being? Take another deep breath. Slowly become aware of this room that we're all in and open your eyes. We hope to make this a very interactive event. So just as we're getting started, I wanted to ask if any of our panelists and any of the audience would like to volunteer, where do they, where do they go to feel that sense of well-being? Just really quickly. Where did you go? Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. More ocean. Sorry to interject, Marana. Uh, just if you could raise your hand so I could pass along the mic. To so we had, uh, sorry, I forgot. We're streaming. Hello, online audience. I keep forgetting Or, or, or Marana, you could repeat. Yes, yeah, so we had surfing, Big Sur, Disneyland. Anybody want to round that up? The beach, okay, a lot of beach, we're in California. My backyard hammock? Backyard hammock. A forest. A forest. What about our panel? I think some, some of you that know me, you know where I went. I was with my chickens. <laughs> and when you asked about smell, I almost started laughing out loud. <laughs> Camping, for sure. Um, yeah, I always go back to an image of, uh, if you're local to the area, Big Basin uh, was a place I grew up going to. Um, so the smells of the redwoods and the campfires and usually the scotch that I had sitting by the campfire mm -hmm. was... Scotch growing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hang out with your family. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for me, I went to the beach, too. Yeah. Uh, I was there yesterday. <clears throat> I was in the forest in South Lake Tahoe, uh, not only for the sense of nature, but also because it's been the place where I've gone since I was six years old. So it reminds me of my brothers and my parents. And, um, you know, there's more to it than just nature, but nature definitely reminds me of those best memories. A lot of us went to a place of nature. And hopefully, just taking a pause made everybody feel a little bit better, a little bit more comfortable, a little bit connected to the room. Now, Josh? Sorry to interject. I just wanted to let folks uh, virtually know uh, there's going to be a Q&A session at the end, and we're going to have uh, entertain your questions then. Thank you so much for your patience. Otherwise, uh, we'll take questions from the audience here at any point in time. Questions, comments, raise your hand. Uh, Josh is going to be running around with a mic, or if he's not fast enough, I'll be repeating your questions for the online audience. Now, why we are here tonight is because most of us, most of the time, do not feel that sense of well-being. We are going through a tremendous well-being and mental health crisis. And especially reflected in our schools and with the students and with teenagers and with the children have been tremendously impacted over the past years. And what we had some statistics I wanted to put in, but I think we all know that this is going on. <laughs> Don't need a lot of data, but there is a big need to restore a sense of well-being in our society. And one place where we can do that, where we can hopefully start to do that, is by influencing the design of the physical learning environment where those teenagers and children and young people and adults come together and spend some significant amount of time. So that's the topic of the discussion today. And I'm going to kick it off with the first question for the panel, and uh, I'm going to open it up to the audience very quickly as well. So we talked about your place of well-being, but when you cannot go camping or to the beach or hug a chicken, she hugs her chickens. 
What do you do to self-regulate in challenging situations and when you're feeling unwell, perhaps in a learning environment? Peter, why don't you start? Mm. <clears throat> well, first, I'd like to frame that question in a sense of um, I, I find myself privileged to have the capacity um, to make a choice about the environment that I'm in. So if I'm in a stressful situation, if I'm in a situation where I'm not comfortable, uh, I get the choice to leave. And that's typically what I would do. Um, I think that if you're empowered to have that freedom, um, what a gift, right? You, you can actually walk away from situations that make you stressful or make you unwell. And we all named those places that we could run to if you're threatened or feeling a sense of anxiety. Um, but that's not true for everybody. And so, um, and, and in public schools, that's also not true for all kids, right? To have that sense of like, I can just walk out of here and go somewhere else, whether that be in the school setting or in their home or in their community. And so part of the panel conversation tonight, I think can help um, realize that reality that not all kids have that capacity to say, I'm just gonna walk away from this. It's the natural one, right? The tendency to run uh, instead of stick around, so. Yeah, I, my, again, the bottom line answer, walk away, get out of there. I love that you, you brought up embodiment right away, bodies in motion. I grew up feeling slightly pissed off all the time, and, and I didn't realize it, but I was actually dysregulated a lot of the time. And it wasn't until I discovered design that I realized what was happening to me was spaces. I, was this, I had this kinetic, hypersensitivity to the quality of space. When I walked into this space, for instance, and I saw that the, you know, the garage door is open and there's a fresh breeze and there's greenery outside, I was like, oh, there's a prayer that I can self-regulate in, uh, you know, understandably a stressful situation. We're sitting up here talking to you, trying to, you know, be smart and say some things that, that will resonate with you. So I think, first of all, is just noticing when you're dysregulated and for, for me, being able to separate just feeling pissed off and irritated with, oh, I'm dysregulated. Oh, what can I do to self-regulate? And, you know, that's where the chickens come in and hands in soil. So that's how I regulate these days. I was going to say I took up drinking, but, you know, I'm probably not <laughs> good to be online telling everybody that, you know, counseling background. Um, I mean, I, I know, right, that's just, okay, God. Won't, Josh won't be inviting me back. But um, I'll just say, I think for me, learning to meditate, you know, in the last, right, I mean, five years and stuff, it's really blown up, right, this idea around meditation. But I really want to thank you, Peter, for, you know, sharing what you're saying, because I was trying to go back and reflect on this question as a, a student and a learner and a person and a being, and I have probably been untethered and felt othered my entire life, right? I'm one of seven. Five of us are adopted. I'm, you know, from a mixed race family. I don't look like anybody in my family. I didn't look like people in my community growing up in Hayward, right? It was mostly black and white, so not a lot of Asians at that time in that community. And so I think that the system didn't always look like me or reflect me or those particular things. And so I think, you know, in those spaces, so I'm a highly self conscious person. And so, like, I think, right, to your point, as I've gotten older and been in this um, field more, I realize how much placemaking matters and how much that safety kind of matters. So for me, it's always having to have go into an inner space of trying to like, you know, breathe deeply, self-regulate myself. But I've become more mindful about the um, meditation part. I, I do it to go to bed at night now, you know, so I'll tell you it works. She's out like a light, you know. Um, I wake up, you know, anxious, but it definitely works for a while. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say drinking because that was my answer. <laughs> no, that's it, environment plays, I think, such a large role in what you can do to self-regulate. Um, one of the most frustrating times in a, a prior career was um, having to do a lot of IT interaction with um, environments like this, uh, trying to get a um, consensus of so many different minds and, and operations. And it was an extremely frustrating time, which is probably when I learned 
to <laughs> self-regulate. Um, I probably didn't have the vernacular at that time, but knew um, I could really find a place anywhere. I was in a high-rise in Wilshire Boulevard that was the, one of the ugliest buildings that you'd ever want to be in. Uh, but we were, we were faced with uh, modernizing it, and it was an extremely frustrating time. And uh, spent many nights alone uh, in that building, calming, regulating, culling data that I really didn't want to take from some folks. Uh, but since then, this, I mean, probably in the last 15 years, um, I can find a self-regulation place anywhere. That little box right there looks great to me. Uh, but given, given the opportunity, my, uh, I have an op a large opportunity to be at home. I have a postage stamp for a backyard, but every square inch uh, is something that I've designed for uh, my own comfort. So you will find me, even if it's raining, in my yard, um, hanging out, regulating, being uh, centered, especially after uh, working in, in the public sector for <laughs> as long as I have. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, I also wanted to thank Peter for bringing up the point of, uh, hey, I have enough agency. I can pick up and go when I want to. Uh, I wasn't going to share mine, but uh, well, what uh, would I do when I'm in a situation like that and uh, hide in a restroom? Anybody else ever done that? Show of hands. Online, you guys too? And it turns out in a lot of public environments, that's the only place where those of us who need to go and hide uh, can go and hide. And on that note, the, the biggie question, and I want everybody to think about this, and uh, I'm gonna ask for some uh, answers from the audience as well. How can schools help students self-regulate in challenging situations and also make them feel safe to do so? Because they cannot always easily just pick up and go and leave. A lot of times, they even need the permission to just go and use the restroom. So what do you guys think? Who wants to go first? Yeah, I, so I can um, go. I mean, I think resources mean a lot, right? So just for contextualization, so you understand, so Laney College, located in Oakland, California, probably um, I you know, when I was the president there, classrooms had not been updated to 21st century learning, you know, faculty were still pushing carts with like computers on them. I mean, this was like in 2017, right? So, you know, students were coming from Oakland Unified, having better learning environments than the college offered. World-class, amazing faculty, but just, um, you know, I was just talking to your trustee the other day, right? The elevators still aren't working. Right? It's really demoralizing to try to like inspire lives when, you know, you're in a space like that. And then, you know, fast forward and come to Evergreen Valley College where, you know, we're building like crazy. Again, we have, um, they've done a really great job of maintaining and building really a, you know, beautiful um, campus community. And so, you know, I've had starkly very, very different lived experiences depending on the space I was in. And so I'll just offer, though, that cutting across that at both institutions, um, one thing that has been um, clear is that, you know, um, I've learned a lot in the last multiple years. And one of the things was that I had transgender students come to me and say, you know, it's great that you feel like you've, you know, complied with the law and you, you know, have a post-it note that says like, you know, the all gender restroom is like all the way across campus, you know, the 60 acre campus, right? So it's, it's not easy to do that, but I'm in the machine technology area and I can't actually use a safe restroom to meal, President Gilkerson. Um, and I have to find and manage, I can barely get back in the five to 10 minute break that the faculty give me. And it's making me actually physically sick. Um, it's like really hard to hold space for students that are telling you that they like, right, can't even actually do a basic fundamental, so not even feel safe and comfortable in a space. 
So for me, it was a multiple year process to work with students and queer identified faculty and staff on our campus to build a community around it. We adopted a resolution um, that all new facilities on our campus would actually be, have all gender restrooms. And let me tell you, that still wasn't an easy fight, right? Because there are lots of conversations and I had it at San Jose too. Um, we've adopted a resolution for our campus, for our builds as well, where people have old ideas about what that means. What I mean to say is that oftentimes you'll say, well, there are sexual predators who might be in those spaces or things. I mean, there I've been in very big conversations um, that are about that, but I think, um, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but um, I, I think it's important to elevate conversation. So design gives you the opportunity to like actually elevate conversations that are social conversations that move institutions along. So right, I can point to, well, really like I was just at this restaurant and you know, floor to ceiling, right? Like, you know, in your bathroom stall, I can still see your feet underneath it, but if you can actually close the entire door, you could get changed in there, right? You could spend some time in there. Um, and, and going out to the trough, to, you know, I call it the trough, right? To wash your hands with everybody. Like, is that, it's, so reminding people that what's happening in other environments needs to actually start to be reflected in the learning environment that we're building with taxpayer dollars and those kind of things. And so, um, so that's one, it's been a huge area of growth for, for me, um, and it's got why I've gotten interested in design so much, why I've been really active in sort of these sort of conversations. Um, and we've done that at Evergreen too, and we've had difficulty as well convincing faculty and staff that um, there is a real reason to have all gender restrooms in all of the buildings that we're doing. And, um, and so how do you kind of explain that and make people feel safe in that environment? So. And, and to answer your question, I think that definitely was part of the answer to the question, how, how do we have the conversation? And I wanted to bring up, you said, well, you know, they said you're complying with the law, but how, what is it actually effectively doing? And uh, my little pet topic is the building code, and people kind of like, okay, well, we need to comply with the code. We need to comply with the law. One of the best, uh, best statements I ever heard was, uh, well, the basic code compliant building is the worst building you're allowed to design. <laughs> so can we do a little bit better? Can, can we not start with the lowest available denominator? Okay, I see that Peter has notes. Oh, I've <laughs> been making notes since I was in kindergarten. They gave me the questions, they're like, you gotta look smart, okay? Okay, I'll look smart. Um, thank you again, Dr. Gilkinson. Um, you, what I heard you talk about first wasn't architectural specifics, design features, walls, right? Uh, but culture. And so I think um, we can't wait for architecture to catch up to everything we need and wait for every school to be redesigned physically to meet the needs of our students, but we can manipulate the way that we enculturate the physical space. So when I talk about that in the practical sense, I mean that if, you know, if a child, a student of any age needs to know that there's another space they can go to, we uh, who are empowered to designate those spaces and, and name those spaces and give permission to go to those spaces um, are the ones that are uh, tasked with making that okay, right? So if, it's, if, if what you need to self-regulate is to leave the room, as I talked about earlier, right? I would like to leave a situation when I'm stressed out. Then you need to be able to say down over there in that garden area, you can go there. Here's a you know, basket of five minute tickets, you could say for first graders or whatever. And, and you know, you have to develop systems to create that safety net to make sure they're not unsupervised if they're really young children. Um, but even as adults, to be able to just say, look, in this class, um, while I might not have the sexy phone booth over there or the uh, furniture that makes you feel perfectly at ease, um, this space is also yours as it is mine. And you have permission to, to regulate yourself by moving around in that space or leaving that space. Uh, there are going to be some inherent rules we create so that we can make sure that everybody is safe and secure. Um, but in a sense, it's culture first, right? You don't, you don't create the physical space to then tell people how to behave. Create the opportunity. And I heard outside, and I was, Anna, you're ready to talk, right? Well, since we brought up kindergartners, that's sort of my, my story. Um, Kindergartners have a tendency to decide that they're done learning and they, they want to run and play outside. Or they are done learning and they want to throw something. 
I was recently at um, my study site school, Live Oak Elementary, and I was in the, in the office, and this very distressed teacher came in. I mean, red in the face, he was practically crying. He was saying this little boy, a second grader, had lost it, was severely dysregulated, and was throwing instruments and uh, chairs around in the music room. And I watched, I mean, I, I held my tongue. My first thought was, the kid needs hands in soil. The kid needs hands in soil. So many teachers have told me that the minute they put a child's hands in soil, they watch them start to calm down and they become different children. It wasn't my place to say it in that moment. I went out to the garden, which was where I was supposed to be in that moment. And I heard how they were passing this kid around to all these different teachers and several hours later, the kid shows up with the principal in the garden. It was the last resort location. So the message I get, which comes from this wonderful book called What Happened to You by Dr. Perry and Oprah Winfrey, is if a child is dysregulated, if an adult is dysregulated, there's not something wrong with them. There's something wrong with the environment or they don't, they're not being allowed to leave the space, go to the bathroom to cry. <laughs> My daughter used to tell me the only safe place in her high school was the concrete steps, uh, be, you know, up and down between classroom wings, and that's where she would go when she had her panic attacks. It's like, we can do better. Right, Paul? We can totally do better. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I was just, it's funny, I was just thinking about panic attacks in, in high school, and, and my wife and I had gone to school together in high school, and she had a much different experience. Uh, high, high, extremely high levels of anxiety, and this is before I even knew her, um, and I had extremely low levels of anxiety. I had three older brothers that paved the way. Everybody knew who I was and didn't expect much from me. Um, so. <laughs> I had a very low bar to set, and uh, I was kind of cruising through high school. Wasn't working very hard, was just having a great time, knew everybody, knew all the upperclassmen. Um, and then I met my wife, and she was in a very stressful situation. She knew nobody. She wanted to be there for a specific uh, dance class. Um, but everything else about the school, the commute to get there, the everything, everything else was a challenge. And so as we were getting to know each other, uh, her stress levels um, were becoming apparent to me. And it, it's funny, I, I had realized, didn't know then, but yeah, she had, um, she would spend an absorbent amount of time in the dance studio, because that was her refuge. Um, and she was given special permission to be there. And this was self-regulating in the 80s, uh, when there really wasn't a lot of that uh, happening. But she, she found it herself. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, and as you alluded to, I was drinking at that point, so. <laughs> and I, little. I know, right? Um, we'll, we'll do it later. Okay. <laughs> you know, Dr. Pratt, you made me think of something. Can I just offer? Um, so I was super excited when I got to Laney because I was like, we're going to redo our bond. We're going to reprioritize our projects. I'm not going to allow faculty and students to be in classrooms that don't have these things, right? We're going to tackle this. So we did a lot of work to reframe a lot of things. And so we decided to do a classroom refresh. So right, we weren't gonna build anything new, right? We, um, we had a lot of, we still have a lot of projects there that need to be done, but decided we were gonna change paint, right? Get whiteboard, we still had chalkboards in these classrooms. We were gonna do whiteboards with markers. We were gonna look at furniture. We were gonna do the things that, you know, you could at least do to freshen up the space. And I wanted to offer, because it was so important what you said is, I could have an idea in my mind about what active learning looks like, right? So we had very, like, right, what you look back in 1920s or whatever, those classrooms with the wood chair, right? Like, I can barely touch my feet right now, right? Like, I probably wouldn't fit in half of those desks and seats that were there. Um, so there is actually a picture of me that I had sent out to the campus community with all these chairs, right? Because they were going to come and pick, select the design. And I'm doing like this with my hands, and I'm in one of those chairs. and. You know, I worked with the design firm and I was so excited because it was the chair on wheels that you could take in and out and you could do all these things. So I was like committed and half the faculty were like, no, we want the old tables with the chairs right up to them. I mean, newer furniture. 
Um, so I stood strong and I was like, nope, we're gonna, like half the classrooms will get this, half of them will do this, right? But I'll tell you, those faculty hated those chairs that were on wheels. And every time I walked into a classroom, it looked a mess, right? Because all the chairs were scrunched. Okay, so again, it's like my mind thought about what it means, right? And so faculty weren't out of space yet where I tried to force a design element on them about what I thought about the kind of learning that needed to be happening and the kind of interaction I wanted them to be having with students. And so I used the furniture, right, as a space for that. But they, in their own way, right, were, and particularly for a certain faculty, were like, we're unwilling to either use that room unless we have to, or the room looked like really discombobulated, is what I would say every time you walked in. And so part of that's like, well, I grew up in a, uh, an environment where, you know, you had desks and rows, and maybe I like order in that way. So I also knew I had to free my mind to really think about the space differently. And how do you invite people in and think about like rearranging things? But I will say that I don't know that the experiment worked that well, frankly. Um, and so I wonder sometimes if students walk into those spaces and feel a little discombobulated because it's such a mess and they got to find their chair and you know they're like kind of rolling around. And so I just, you know, I I, I think. There's so many pieces to not just selecting the thing, but having you all or those of you who are in the design world as partners to really think through these elements, particularly for somebody who has a great idea, but you know, it's like the execution of that and then where does that go afterwards? So how do we teach people to use the spaces? How do we actually like create a full service model? So. I have to add something. Anna, thank you for bringing up kindergarten. How many of you know Title V requirements for building schools, right? You're at least somewhat familiar, and you know kindergarten classrooms are 1,200 minimum? 13. 13? Oh, 13. I've only been on the facility side four years. 1,300 square feet minimum, and then everything after that, first through 12th, is 96 square feet. And, and the class size numbers, as the bodies get bigger, classrooms get smaller, the class size numbers go up, not down. Um, I'd say in part to answer the question is um, the kindergarten model of instruction is quite informative. We could learn a lot from kindergarten. It's all a cliche, of course, you know, everything I learned in kindergarten. But if you watch a kindergarten teacher, um, they use that 1300 square feet very strategically and they help students self-regulate by designing what they call their learning centers. And some of them are set up in a corner for that one child who needs to be by him or herself reading a book, right? And they all tell you, like, if you need to do something individually, you go to that corner. If you want to work in pairs, you go over there. And the materials are set up for you. There's little partitions that the teacher can see everything, but the kids really are somewhat sheltered from having to keep an eye on everybody. Um, that center's learning model um, is a great model to help us understand, like, how do we help kids self-regulate? The unfortunate issue is that we tend to restrict it as the students get older. Um, and then the last thing you said, chairs. So we were at Napa Valley New Tech High in March. There, I got one person. Was anybody else with me there? We were, you were there, you were there. Um, we were at a specialty, we call it a specialty high school. It was an elementary school site that was re-modernized uh, to serve a, what we would call a small learning community high school. They had about 300 students total in 9 through 12. And we were there during the school day. That was really special, right? And the kids were part of the panel. They were telling us what they liked about the building. And you know the one thing that kept coming up over and over again was the chairs, we love the chairs, we love the chairs. Uh, the chairs came actually, the initial design came from the fact that they were donated from the businesses around Napa, right? They needed different chairs, they wanted different chairs. But the kids were talking about the ability to roll around in their rooms and go knee to knee with somebody that they needed to work with or move over somewhere else. They were comfortable, that they could rock, that they could move, that whole idea of Self-regulation is also an act of physical movement, the physical place, whereas the more rigid plastic chairs you'll see in rows in the high school classrooms, the traditional high school classrooms, are the ones that you know, um, expect students to self-regulate in an environment that doesn't really um, support them. So. And bringing up those chairs, I remember one of the, so they had wheels, they, everybody raved about the chairs, but one of the other things, they were not kids' chairs, they were office, business, adult chairs. And this was a high school, and a lot of them felt like, well, okay, we're being treated like adults here. So we're gonna act like adults here and take 
uh, and take charge and take responsibility for ourselves yeah. as well. And it was project-based learning, and I think yeah. the chairs actually contributed to that. Chairs. The kids all knew that they could also um, move out of the room because of the large windows into the common area that had used to be, a, I think, a courtyard, an outdoor courtyard. They were individual elementary classrooms, and so they covered the courtyard with a roof and built a common space, and the teachers could see the students, right? You're supposed to always keep an eye on your kids. But the kids knew that if they needed to, they could walk right out there and, and like, enjoy that space instead. It was much, I mean, it was more than chairs, but the kids were cute the way they said, it's, I love these chairs. And I didn't see them at my other high school. So the kids self-select this high school, that was one thing. They toured the comprehensive, and they toured the space at New Tech High, and they made a conscious decision. So that actually brings up another question, and something that we discussed but did not script, is a lot of times when we talk about well-being or wellness, is let's build the wellness room, that we have a room that's designated for wellness, and what Peter has been talking about is other ways of approaching it. So. Let's think about the chair. Let's do the kindergarten concept, and instead of creating a room, creating all of the rooms in a way where you can do different things and feel different ways within the spaces. And again, not go with the code minimum of the square footage for the other classrooms, right? Uh, so thinking about that, we, we started with how, what, what we can do, how we can do. Any ideas from either the panel or the audience? Again, we have a lot of people experienced with learning environments for some of the things that we could do that don't involve a new building or a new room or completely revising the space planning. I think so. We, uh, we recently, like we were talking about uh, one of the uh, high schools we are redoing in Dublin. I think Josh is going to mic you up. <laughs> so uh, this is one of the projects that we are just recently doing in um, the Dublin High School School District. And this topic of well-being and like having a space to go came up a lot with the teachers and the students when we uh, did a lot of creative engagements with them. And basically what you were talking about, like having a well-being room or a calmness room is a completely different, different category. But how do you incorporate that in every room of your every classroom, every space? So again, building architectural walls and adding those spaces is absolutely not, not a doable thing. So what we did is we had just taken that small screen where the, these two girls are sitting and in a, just in the corner of the classroom have created a simple space where if you need to go, take a minute, or even if the teacher needs to take a minute, five minutes, just a break, there's a small space in there. So I think that's the way we kind of try to do it. It's a great idea. Any other ideas from the audience? I don't think this is a new idea, but um, what I remember from school and I would like to see in our higher education environment is multiple um, options for seating in a classroom. You have um, maybe something more structured and then maybe some high, high top tables in the back. I know a lot of that depends on um, what type of class it is and how the curriculum is being delivered. We use the rolling chairs almost everywhere. <laughs> and um, I think that there would be some great um, feedback that we could get if we had options for students to sit in. And that could also help with um, being body inclusive as well, which is something that we are working on on our campus. Thank you. Anybody else? OK. He needs some exercise. <laughs> um, I think it's something that you guys have done well here, and we've talked about. All of our calm spaces is nature. Like, you got to bring that nature indoors somehow, whether it's natural lighting, whether it's greenery, whatever that is, bringing that nature inside is going to help everybody, not just the individual person. By the way, the panel can jump in at any point in time. So to kind of uh, continue the theme that the previous speaker had, it would be great if we could actually integrate treed natural spaces in our schools, not just open space, because there's a lot of fields and a lot of public schools are large sites, but they're just so undefined and so huge, people get lost in them and creating smaller spaces or different scales of spaces which are accessible to everybody. So it's a common space for so many, and everybody may not have 
the time to access it at the same time. So there's enough for everyone, I think. That would be so much easier to create and, and hopefully maintain because budgets unfortunately make schools pave a lot of space instead of retaining them as green spaces. I think that would help a lot. I'll touch on um, something you just mentioned about furniture and uh, in a number of our projects recently, we've addressed uh, that same furniture issue with what I've, I mean, I've, I've been completely amazed at how positively uh, receptive uh, our classrooms have been with our approach to classroom seating. So we also went with a standard where everything is on wheels. And in a middle school or even an elementary school, to me, historically, that's unheard of. You want to nail everything down. Um, but we went with a, a low pile carpet and casters on the wheels and the desks. Uh, we also did theater seating. So we would have, in a typical classroom, 16 chairs at a typical classroom, like 27 to 31 inch height. Then we'd have uh, another row of 16 in middle height in the, in the middle of the classroom. And then in the back, um, you'd have eight uh, standing desks where you could either sit at a stool or you could stand or combination thereof. And the number of students and parents that came to us and said, if you did that on purpose, that was phenomenal. My kid cannot stand still. Um, and she actually is able to focus in this class now. Um, and this, it's just the simple, you know, the ability for her to stand and listen uh, enabled her to just rock and back and forth. And so the number of testimonials that we got just from that small change uh, made us really focus. That is now our standard. When we're outfitting a classroom, uh, anytime we're gonna re-outfit a classroom, we're gonna go with that as a standard and, and modify from there. But I'll tell you, that's, that's been something that has enabled us to reconfigure a room on the fly um, instantly and create small spaces, collaborative spaces, uh, Socratic spaces in less than 30 seconds. So definitely something I would look into. Uh, I know there's a few furniture people around that might be able to <laughs> give you a card or something. Actually, I'm going to follow up with what you were just talking about, Paul, is it to really advocate for the importance of the professional development that goes on with the teachers with the in installation of, the, of that furniture. And uh, I think one of your sites, uh, there was a, a furniture pilot that was really elaborate. It lasted over many, many weeks where the teachers got a chance to work with the students and work with the furniture before you set that standard. Whereas in another situation where maybe that same furniture gets stuck into a classroom and the teachers haven't been trained and they, they're sort of at a loss, what are we doing with this? We don't understand this um, and so forth. And I think that's kind of what you were describing too. So, I mean, there's, uh, there's sort of, uh, it's not just about the furniture. Furniture is great, um, but it's really about making sure that everybody understands how to use that as well. Exactly. Add one more uh, thing. Like with all this furniture seating, like you talked about the tiered seating and everything, one thing that gets really overlooked is the floor seating. And I think for all that well-being and that being grounded, that is so important for I think any age. Uh, that's why we see all these uh, in offices. Everybody has yoga mats and like nice things, but there's nothing in schools. So mm -hmm. just wanted to add that. I, uh, I had a question for Paul as a follow-up. I know you recently uh, redid a couple of middle schools in your district um, that have incorporated nature, and so we're talking about nature. Several of the people in the audience have talked about it. Can you maybe talk about how you've integrated uh, natural elements into those campuses and, and what the feedback's been from <laughs> sure. parents, teachers, or staff? Okay. Sorry, go, go I'll ahead. I'll preface this by saying two of the people most responsible for the influx of the, the natural environments are Anna and John from ADIS. So just so you know, that's, yeah, yeah. I'm the beneficiary of it. And these guys actually did a phenomenal job educating us and me specifically on even the ability to bring that into a scholastic environment. Um, but so we, yeah, we've done a few middle schools, one of them in particular, um, this was right after, uh, so I'm down in Gilroy. Um, one of the design, uh, the design was kicked off right after the uh, Gilroy Garlic Festival event, um, and it was polarizing for everybody in town. And it's very much reflected in the design of that school. It's very, uh, it's a very security um, 
conscientious design. So all of the classroom pods are inward facing with uh, protective doors. There's three layers of protection. But if you were to walk onto that campus, you would have not seen or felt that level of security uh, because it was designed with so much um, outdoor learning environments throughout the campus. And at the heart of every classroom pod is a, uh, is a joint uh, outdoor learning pod. So um, every, if you can imagine a, a, a circular environment with seven classrooms, they all uh, face um, a central pod very, almost identical to this with a big roll-up door uh, that the, the teacher can open up that door. It's a nine foot wide door and it opens up into an uh, environment um, that we have big uh, basalt columns that are uh, set out and then there's a courtyard with uh, trees and, um, and some shrubs, um, some of them very specific to the, to the, uh, to the environment. Um, and every one of those rooms is uh, highly uh, adaptable to the, to the daylight coming in. So, uh, they were old, if you're familiar with what a finger wing school looks like, those old style long rows and, and sometimes opposed to the, uh, the, to the way the sun runs, um, you don't get any really good daylight in there. These were, are quite different. Um, so there's a lot of skylights and, and bringing in uh, naturally filtered daylight was phenomenal for the, just for the environment itself. Um, outdoor, I think at, at Brownell, one of the out, outdoor learning environments, there's 18 different pods all around the campus that are set up for um, natural instruction or even uh, collaborative spaces or restorative spaces. So yeah, they're, and both, both campuses are very similar in that same regard. Um, but yeah, hopefully that touched on your answer. Have a couple more comments from the audience. Please. Sure. Uh, I had a question on how much do you think the uh, uh, change in well-being has to do with the change in curriculum, in particular the um, uh, loss of the shop classes, the music, the dance. Um, Anna, you and Paul both touched on, you know, your wife in high school, that was her safe place, was her dance studio, and, you know, the hands in soil. Um, you know, a lot uh, for a lot of those students, those were their safe places. Those were the, the classes where they excelled, where they got to you know, stand up and work on cars or machinery or you know, get down on their hands and knees and, and work in the soil or, or you know, grab a musical instrument and, and you know, create something. Now that those are gone, you know, we're kind of forcing these kids back into these environments, you know, uh, physical and learning where you know it, it, it's uh, not in uh, con uh, conductive to you know to their well-being and yeah and uh, yeah I I'm not sure um, I'm not sure I would say that they are not able to find refuge in a in a typical environment. Um, don't get me wrong because yeah stripping out music or anything outside the core curriculum uh, is a travesty to me as well. So I wouldn't support that, uh, don't support it, although I live in that world. Um, but I don't think that they, uh, it, you can find a restorative place, you can find a collaborative space in any environment. And I'm living proof of that. I've been in very stressful environments and very ugly environments. Um, and I can still find you know, a hole to crawl into or um, a, a space that would make me comfortable. Um, so it is, I think it, it's a product of the environment that you're in and your ability to, to do that. But those places would be a lot easier, I think, for most, like, just like my wife, yeah. You know, speaking about nature-based outdoor learning, which is sort of my area, what I found was the curriculum didn't matter, which is really good news because not every school is going to change their curriculum. I did my pilot project in a traditional elementary school and all I asked of the teachers was to take their kiddos outside for five minutes in one week. And I gave them a five minute lesson to do, which was based on uh, John Muir Laws. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of if any, if we have any nature journalists in the room, I see some nods. Just notice something about the outside. And this very strange phenomenon happened. As the children and the teachers went outside, 
for these little five minute lessons, which then became 10 minute lessons, which then became reading in the garden, which then became, oh, let's open the garden during recess because some kids just wanted to prune the rose bushes, prune the bushes during recess instead of play basketball. What they started to do was just naturally incorporate the nature environment into their math lesson. Their, this was a multilingual school, into their literacy lesson. And the next thing I knew, nature-based outdoor learning was happening and curriculum hadn't changed at all. So giving teachers permission to go outside, understanding that indoor spaces by their very nature are dysregulating. So the minute you put a child or children or adults in inside spaces for a lengthy period of time, like I'm feeling a little trapped at the moment, like I'm ready to go outside, we start to get dysregulated. So when we use biophilic design, we bring greenery in, we, we make sure there's natural light, we're making a space less bad, more like what's naturally available on the outdoors. However, bringing up racialized space and and privilege and lack of access to nature. A lot of outside spaces on campuses are absolutely devoid of shade, they're hot, they're inhospitable, dangerous places for children to be. So my call to action for you all in interior design, in furniture, in architecture is to think more about this untapped resource on the outside of the door and help us make it more hospitable so we can get more kids outside. So I know your question was really probably more K through 12. Um, I do wanna just offer to the room, right, that we're in a very different space in higher education related to the pandemic and um, this sort of push to online learning, right? Nobody believed we could do it. Then all of a sudden faculty like, I never wanna come back. Nobody wants to come back to work, right? And we did all these bonds and we have beautiful facilities going up, right? But we are overbuilt now for really providing distance education. Um, but what we have found in the pandemic, what we found here in Santa Clara County, right, is students of color, racialized students of color, black, Latinx, Pacific Islander students have left K through 12 in droves, have not come back, and they are not persisting through, right, through the next level. So we see it in the Silicon Valley data. Um, and so, you know, part of you begins to wonder, right, when people are in their home environment and having to connect online when you have digital access, I mean, Silicon Valley just paid for digital access grants for the community, so not everybody has the infrastructure we think. We're in a very rich environment and there's a lot of not haves. So I think that there's some pieces around, for us, having some thought partners around, like, how do we really think about hybrid learning models? How do we think about, like, folks who are, right, while, while we're teaching asynchronously, some people in the classroom, some not, how do we, like, kind of create environments that are allowed to do that? And then we also know that online learning isn't the best for students. So I've been doing distance education statewide data for years. There are absolutely huge racial equity gaps when we look at outcomes for students in distance education and it's now exacerbated with what's just happened with the pandemic so we're going to see parts of this coming down the line so we also need to be encouraging and building spaces particularly those who have bonds sitting out there and are like redesigning their spaces now or are going to go out for that next geo bond right um, or parcel taxes to begin to think about how do we invite people back because we actually know they learn better in person right so to your point right so it's not even about the type of we just know that like recursive and being in community with people and and that's what the data shows about us being the loneliest planet right i mean we have more depression right in the united states of america than anywhere worldwide i mean it is an epidemic so we need to be calling people back into spaces um and so i think that there's something for us to think about as we're um, really more people say they want to be learning online and we just know that it's not the best for the outcomes or the relationship building can we put that on a billboard somewhere please <laughs> yes no i think And I love what you said about making space compelling to return to because I did not return to the office. I don't know if any of the rest of you did because I live, you know, in the beautiful forest and I have my chickens as aforementioned. So making, making school, and I agree with you 100% as an educator, I've taught online, in person and hybrid and there's no, there's no doubt that the data shows that actually hybrid is really the best, having some interaction and then some quiet time where you can work by yourself. So what do we do to make 
uh, folks want to come back into in-person environments, this is a really good example of an in-person environment that I am grateful to be in. So thank you, the designers that did this space. We have, uh, sorry, uh, one um, question from the online community. Yes, I just wanted to relate to the panel. And just encourage those uh, joining virtually, uh, please submit your questions to the panel via the Q&A, and we will relay them to the panel at the conclusion of the panel discussion. Uh, we have this question uh, right here from a middle, I am a middle school counselor trying to create a safe space for students to take a break, come to groups, and regulate. What advice do you have for counseling spaces? What have you seen that works well, and what would you recommend avoiding? Can I take that? So Go I'm ahead. involved in um, a non small nonprofit called Good Nature Learning, and we're actually doing a nature, a Brains on Nature fellowship, and we've invited two school counselors to come to the Brains on Nature fellowship because there's a lot of uh, evidence that points to doing counseling sessions outside is more effective. Walking in under tree canopy, being in a space that's free of walls does a, is, a, is a big benefit. So I would say to this person, uh, thank you for your question. It's an amazing question. It's very relevant to what we're talking about. And I would look for a, a, a hospitable place outside, somewhere with some shade. I'm looking at Josh because Josh, Josh is the, my link to this middle school counselor. Look for a place with shade and encourage your counselors to take children outside for conversations, uh, counseling conversations, and, and see how that goes. Speaking of uh, counselors, I do want to give a shout out to my mother who's here today, a psych uh, psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic social worker in private practice uh, who's been here <laughs> working in the South Bay for and the I last 34 years. And I think we have a question here in the audience. Right here. Yeah. Thank you. This was really helpful. Um, as I'm, you know, just thinking about the beginning meditation, uh, my mind wandered into my kitchen where my husband was making a pie and I was smelling the pie. And, you know, in a social anxious uh, moments, I always have my phone, something familiar. And I work with anxious and socially anxious uh, students. And often they are really, really, it helps them to have routines. It helps them to not feel uh, separated in an in-person environment where they have to go separating themselves somewhere else, but they like to have something that's familiar to them. So in, in a classroom setting, one of the recommendations I was thinking about was um, how amazing would it be if a person was okay with taking and pulling out their phone and maybe even listening to some music where it was okay to you know, be able to get some music indoors whenever the person needed it or if they were able to have access to soothing sounds, something that they are accustomed to. Perhaps it's not a manufactured environment where it's not just about the light and how beautiful something looks, but something that they are actually feeling okay with. So if I picture my kitchen, I just suddenly feel okay because it's something familiar to me. So routines and the familiarity really helps. Iram, you just made me think of Josh talking about he went to a silent disco, which I'm gonna totally do, but like, I mean. You should. It, I, I mean, I, it, you're making me think, though, right, that there is uh, the melding between technology, right, and the built environment and technology, and then using sort of what we know as well, like, as uh, being able to do maybe some of what you're saying. It sparks that for me. So. Um, sorry for the distraction. Uh, we realize that it's 6.30. We have a couple of questions, Marana, from the online community, yes, if that's okay. Yes, let's, let's take a few questions, and we're going to have an interactive portion of the program coming up in a few minutes. So oh, everybody brace themselves. Great. Uh, so this is from Winston Bao from LPA. Winston from Southern California, thanks for joining. Can you cite planning precedents, initiatives, or influences you have learned to meet student basic needs and the other eight dimensions of wellness? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I don't know that I can cite things, um, but I can say that um, I've certainly been um, co-chairing uh, since 2018, um, the CEO Affordability Food and Housing Access Task Force um, of the California Community College CEOs. 
And I want to say, you know, I'm really proud of the work in the last, you know, since 2018 of the legislation and the things that we've had to build basic needs centers, right, to have basic needs coordinators, to have food pantries and those things. And I think, you know, often what we did is we said, we have a food pantry, right? <laughs> like, we actually have a food pantry, yay! You know, at Laney College, it was a food pantry up an elevator on the third floor of a broken building that was like a room that we redid and we put shelves in and we bought a refrigerator and we hauled it up the thing and it doesn't have dignity, right? I mean, but campus was are trying, so this is no shade to a college that was trying to actually meet the thing, but the space did not allow or the funding did not allow for that. So I think, you know, um, and you know, at Evergreen we have a different kind of pantry, but I think, you know, colleague over here, we were talking earlier about the fact that like I, my vision and what we were doing with a partnership with Union Bank was saying, we'll let you build a bank branch on campus, you help me build like a Whole Foods type of, you know, basic need center where you go in with dignity, it looks like a market, nobody knows anything different, right? So how do we begin to think about where do we build things, where do we have food nooks around campus, right, that can be just kind of nestled in somewhere to do this? How, as we're proliferating now student housing and all of these developments, um, unfortunately the, fun, the formula for getting state funding for those is about cost per bed and it's not really about actually the stuff we need around basic needs. So I encourage you know, the folks who are online um, you know, to help us advocate, frankly, actually. I mean, we're, a lot of us are advocating around the fact that we need um, the legislature and for folks to understand that in order to like actually that Maslow's hierarchy need, which, you know, there's some conversation about now, but right, I mean, those particular things have to be built in and funded um, and be able to support it ongoing, right? So all of the work we've been doing over the last many years is on soft dollars, frankly, right? It's on partnerships and things like that. And so we are looking at an economy that may not be here. And so I also worry about that with I loved your idea about like building out here, but I've been in a campus where we had a lot of open spaces and then when you don't have money or time or you have to lay people off, they're brownfields on your campus, right? So it's, it's like for me, it's a little bit of a dynamic about that, but I absolutely believe now's the opportunity um, specifically for community colleges as we're doing so much work around it to be thinking about um, uh, helping campuses actually develop standards so they don't have them. I'll use I statements to Neil Gilkerson. San Jose Evergreen Community College System doesn't have a standard around that and maybe we need to start developing it where that's a component of a scoring rubric even you know at the legislative level or the state level but even on your own campus you can have agency to decide that those things will be elements that you want to make sure are built in. I have another question from the online community. Uh, this is from Helen Chu. Hello Anna, thank you for talking about biophilic spaces <laughs> that inspire instructors and students into the outdoors. Would you share some ideas for bringing the outside in via interior design choices, colors, prints, lighting, FF&E, et cetera, in shared, easy to maintain university classrooms? Other ideas? Hi, Helen. I think we were in the uh, ALEP cohort together. I, I want to talk about basic needs and food security and also add, uh, address Helen's question. UCSC is doing a really good job. If you want to have an, an example, there's a, a real food and housing security issue among students. They're growing. I just attended a benefit for food security, and of course they have the farm, right? But what they're doing is they are planting the farm with foods that students want to eat. So it's really about getting the, the produce to, into, the hands of, into the hands of children, into the hands of young adults. And I see that also in Santa Cruz with Life Lab, uh, supporting school gardens, growing community school movement, which Tony Thurmond, our, um, our superintendent of state superintendent of schools, is a big fan of, which was very big in Oakland. I'm sure Tamil's uh, aware of it. Uh, and as, as far as biophilic design, I have always been a, a huge fan of biophilic design because of the sensitivity. We talked about the dysregulation early on not realizing why in a closed room with it's all gray with no windows i feel like i'm going to scream and i have to get outside and still conference rooms in conferences are are like that like we know we know better um, it is important to bring the the interior the nature into the inside spaces because we do spend time in inside spaces one of the kindergarten teachers that i worked with did a really great job of this he brought in a small terrarium 
Uh, I've seen other teachers completely cover their, their classrooms in plants and living materials. I know Morana, as a part of our biophilic design conversation, she brought a bunch of plants into her classroom. Uh, so when you can't get outside, like let's exhaust all the opportunities outside and you're forced inside, it's raining, it's pouring, it's snowing, although people in Portland, Maine will go out in the snow anyway. Yes, make the interior environments as biophilic as possible. Use the colors of nature, use minimally processed natural materials, bring in um, water, sounds of water, bring in small uh, herb gardens so that you can take a taste or a smell when Morana was doing her mindfulness exercise, she engaged all five senses, and my calm, I, I hit calm when she got to the smell and the taste senses, because I started to feel the embodiment of kind of calming down. So think multisensory. Can I, can I um, just do one arc back to and you made me remember that we also make assumptions that we design for like a moment, right? So I said like, go in the food pantry and get your food, right? Every community college now is doing farmer's markets, is doing major food distribution, right? So Second Harvest, have any of you volunteered to Second Harvest food distribution? They're amazing, right? But you're getting like a thousand sweet potatoes, right? You're getting 25 onions. You're getting, I mean, it's a lot of things where if you're a multi-generational family house, which many of our communities are, it's great, right? But for a lot of our students, it's very hard to say like, what do I do with a potato? Especially if I don't have some place to cook it, right? Or like, what do I do? Or if it's culturally not actually what my community actually eats, right? And I'm unfamiliar. So some of the thing that we need to think about in the basic needs things is not just how do we deliver and say we did it, and like be done, but how do we actually move to the next level, which we give people agency on that next part, where where do we have open, my colleague over here was talking about open kitchen labs, right? So again, it wouldn't be same DSA for like an instructional kitchen, but like what about open spaces where students could get together and there's like, you know, here's the five recipes that we could all do if we know something's happening, you know, um, and boost, it was your last name, boost, boost, right? It'd be your first name though. Sarah, so I just want to give Sarah a shout out because we had a really great conversation. So not to be taken, she'd be like, that girl is up there talking about my, um, so it wasn't at all, Sarah. I want to give you like, so P I think it's PLA, right? PPK, okay, sorry. Anyways, talk to her later because she's amazing. But I, I, I want to just offer out that I think that there is something in sort of these design conversations of like asking executives like me, where else do you want to go? Like, is it going to actually meet the need, right? Because oftentimes we don't know that. And so you have a lot of space to be able to help, you know, provide those kind of conversations. And I know I'm not supposed to be answering the questions, but my name got mentioned here a couple of times. And actually that particular class, and I was talking about, I have one of the students run a class here. But what we did addresses Helen's question and also it partially addresses the, there was a food component to it as well. So what we did, the university environment, low maintenance, no budget. Uh, every student or most of the students brought a plant to class and kept it in the classroom for the duration of the semester and took care of them together. We had like a watering time in a class. So it gave us a break, sense of community and some greenery. And then they took them back at the end of the semester. We named the plants too. But the other thing that came up, and I encourage students to find one thing to do. What, what is one thing we can do? Because we, we don't have a very nice learning environment. We came back to the classroom. We were happy to be together, even though the environment wasn't inviting because we felt so isolated online. And uh, somebody started the snack drawer. And it was actually, we had some drawers that were empty. And somebody put in snacks and help yourself. And, you know, some people have more availability or they have leftovers or, and that, that was packaged food. So somebody would always be dropping it off. Anybody was welcome to take some. And we had, and we started having people from out of classrooms come and join in, into the snack drawer. It was a very, very popular intervention and uh, also fostered well-being when, you know, you have, you need a little bit of a sugar high to make it through the three-hour class. Speaking of which, uh, we're going to take a, a quick break, I believe, or there's one comment from yeah. Peter, and then we're going to take um, an interlude, I think, Marana, for five minutes uh, for, for a session internally, correct? Mm -hmm. And for those folks online, 
uh, please again submit your questions via the Q&A uh, so that we can address them when we get back from this, uh, from this quick uh, five minute break. Yes, Peter. So just a word of advice, right, from this wise old guy who's been around uh, public education 27 years and now working in um, program and construction management for four years. And I, I just remember these ideal hopes and dreams that had gotten a little too far ahead of my schools. Um, and in two cases, right? So one was a bit like this interdisciplinary instructional model that would bring art and music back into the classrooms, right? How to learn math through music or how to learn how to read by studying science. And so in that case, in that culture, in that school environment, um, there were a few people inside and a lot of architects and designers outside who said, we know how to do that. We'll build it and they will come. And then they built it and the culture said, no, we're not doing interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary instructional models. The HR department says that I'm a math credential and you know, the kids have to be in my room for math and it's math. And so I'm gonna stay over here in the old building. Um, in the other case, it was middle school. So you'd think, well, credentials and interdisciplinary would be easier. The architects and designers, brilliant ideas. We wanted team teaching. I was the principal at this school and 18 classrooms with nine movable walls so that you could actually, you know, the idea again, team teaching, children are less anxious when they can actually identify with one discipline that they love and then another discipline that they're challenged by and now I can kind of learn that challenge through a vehicle that I love so I'm not so put off by everything. Those walls never opened because nobody had, nobody had actually thought of like, we need to tap into how to change the culture too. We need, to, we need to understand how the current environment, the current culture of teaching and learning exists in this K-14 or this university space. And, and yeah, try to influence change in that regard, but don't do it by running miles ahead with uh, a built environment and then look back and realize that the people aren't prepared um, to work and live in that environment. Um, so, so again, kind of walking hand in hand by understanding what the culture does now, what the culture says it needs sooner than later and not letting just a couple people in each of those school communities or districts kind of claim what they think is best and then you know, later say, well, why aren't, why aren't we doing team teaching anymore? I built the walls that move and then they don't. Thank you, Peter. It was a good word of advice to just start with something small, something you can do now, something you can do right away, which is a couple of more questions online that we wanted to take before we wrap up. No? Okay. Hi, hi, Rejesh, I'm with HMC Architects. I am curious, um, I work with a lot of teachers and district workers um, for schools, and us designers have a lot of progressive ideas that we wanna bring into schools. And like you touched on, how do we design these spaces that are years ahead of what these educators and these district people are comfortable with? And I'm interested on how you would facilitate a conversation with these people who aren't quite comfortable with a lot of these things that we're proposing. How do we get them comfortable and convince them that these are kind of the right things to do moving forward since we know the research, but they have a lot of pushback towards it. So where's this middle ground? How do we facilitate these conversations to actually create these meaningful spaces? And when we're done with them, allow these teachers to actually know how to use them and move in these spaces. Did you cue that question? Did I? <laughs> so, can I start? You want to start? Yeah. Okay, so first, I think I would say we all can um, understand a little more about where our teachers are coming from by understanding the policies and the histories that they're confronted with every day. So the histories, obvious, uh, to me obviously now, I, but the history is that you know our public education system is built on an industrial revolution model, right? We've decided to um, uh, design curriculum for a group of kids that are a particular age. We've also, as they get older, decided to design curriculum and build our buildings towards a, a singular discipline, right? And the policies today still encourage that kind of mindset where the, the teacher teaching mathematics has been in a credential program before that for mathematics and her authority or his authority to give credits for mathematics are only for mathematics. So this interdisciplinary idea of wellness 
um, is, is difficult to break through, right? Because the policies tell them that you belong in a mathematics class and you belong in a science class and you're an art teacher and everybody's got these, I mean, if you look at the California credentialing system, it's very rigid and siloed. The other piece is also then, so institutional histories and things like that, that that's what they're, they're living with this idea that they will be held accountable to stay within their lane. Um, the other, you know, and, and to break through into some environment that doesn't support that is difficult. And the other is to also understand what the local culture says you can break through. So does, while you're engaging with teachers, saying we should, you know, build movable walls or add indoor, outdoor, um, does, the, does the district culture, and by district culture, do the people who make decisions, the board, the executives, the principals, the parents, right, the community, do they support a mixed model? Do they support their teachers taking risks? Um, and if not, then you've got a hard, hard hill to climb there asking your teachers to change their ways and saying that they can change their ways if I design a, a, a physical space for you, right? So um, just to understand that, that nature between our history and that present day culture that might either restrict them or empower them to do so. So a lot of community college and university um, co campuses um, in the wake of the racial reckoning and stuff are talking about how do we decolonize our curriculum? How do we really rethink um, our own policies and processes and the ways in which we're approaching things? Like how does our policy, our procedure, like kind of do these things? And so part of me thinks a lot about design thinking. So I use this a lot in my management work and other things is like, how do you flip on its head, right? And put, you know, the space where it belongs. So part of, I've been in multiple, I think I recognize some of you, right? Multiple design team things, right? It's the same thing, right? You do a vignette, you know, you get feedback, you do them like with each group, you know, the design committee for a campus has like, you, it's like the um, Noah's Ark model, two by two by two, right? I got two classified, I got two faculty members, I got two administrators who are from the division, who represent the voice. So I think part of it could be pushed around, like how do you flip the model totally? So what do we know about good learning, right? Good learning is you have to introduce in a safe space other design, learning modules, things like that, that could actually be. So do you work with a college? I'd be willing to think about this now that we're brainstorming it together. But you know, like, so how do you actually do an educational setting where you invite all the players, right? To actually like hear a couple days or have a mini conference that's like about like what, what's happening in spaces, right? So you can ignite fire. How do you actually do a fishbowl with students and center actually how, what students want? when they hear about these things, right? So that you sort of create more of a generous, so spending more time on the less like, let's check a box. Because at the end of the day, everybody's mad because they didn't get the paint color they wanted, the like, piece they want, and then you have to design out all of these things, right? I mean, honestly, uh, your budget doesn't like fit what, what it is that you wanted. So I think that there might be some element of actually just a really re like shaking up and rethinking the whole engagement process to start much earlier on um, and to be free to an institution. I'm just throwing this out too, right? I mean, y'all make money off the backs of these institutions, right? Like, why don't y'all get together and like actually think about like holding a design summit or doing something disruptive that you all wanna do if you really wanna design for what you know it says, right? So a college president doesn't have the capacity to read. I mean, I'm interested in it just cause I'm interested in it, right? But I mean, I don't, we're not running around reading architecture of books, right? So we're trying to check the box to make sure we can keep our job and get the building up for the taxpayer dollar and please the board of trustees and have less strife when I make them all move into the new space. So, so I think, you know, I think that there's room, right, for the community of designers to really rethink and you've got, you know, 116 colleges of the community colleges, right? 115 ones online, right? So um, to think about what you could do differently. So I don't know, I put it back on you all to think you're the designers, like it might be really cool to think of something new. I have one practical idea to follow up with you. Okay. So um, I'd love to promote my wonderful company, but I won't, I'll promote the nonprofit I work for. And what we do at A4LE is we actually bring designers and school district people into schools during school days based on this assumption that that particular setting has a design feature that we want other people to learn about and why is it so marvelous and so we do about four tours a year and we go into places where something's been disrupted and instead of doing i think it's called charrettes yeah, the charrettes sure. form where you do that representative governance piece where you think you've heard everybody but you actually challenge it by saying no no no, no. let's go look and see what it what it actually looks feels like smells like tastes like in an environment where it's already working and and to be able to bring 
those constituents, right, into other places. I think, Paul, you've done that before. Before you designed your middle and high schools, you brought teachers to other districts to say, let's not just ask you what you think you want. But let's show you what other districts are doing well, uh, where, they've, where they've made a significant change in the built environment to support something else. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, there's a number of things that you can do to tie both sides together. And w I think from the public sector perspective, it's, uh, I'm the middle guy, I'm the middle man. So to bring an architect's ideas, design to a, a, a classroom teacher um, and get them to buy in, there's a lot of sewing that goes on. And there's, um, you know, I, I'm touting uh, ATIS. You guys did a, um, and Anna used to work for ATIS, so I'm, I'm pointing because that's the capacity at which I knew her. Um, but they did a lot of hand-holding because there was, a, there was so much uh, change in the livelihood of what was about to happen. You know, we're going from a very static rectangular room, everything's in rows, to a much more collaborative in, uh, environment in so many elements. I, I truly saw that we were starting to lose some folks during that initial design phase because everybody wanted to be heard. Right, a teacher wants to be heard. They, whether it's the paint color, whether it's more uh, daylight, uh, you've got to. I have to, as as a bond director, be able to point those things out. Say, hey, in the, in the design, you guys asked for more fresh air. I I put a nine foot door in every classroom. You're getting fresh air, um, and and be able to. Um, put the hat, you know, tout that to them. That's your design you're, as a teacher. Once you get those, uh, the staff to buy in, they're gonna own it and they're going to incorporate those designs, those elements. Anything you want, you really have to sell it. Um, and you've gotta get your, you, your, sorry, your primary contact. You told me not to do that. <laughs> but you gotta get your primary contact. I did, that was a mic drop. Um, the, the, but you do, you have to get that buy-in um, because otherwise your design will die on the vine. You have to get them to own it and be a partner in that, whatever it is, whether it's biophilic design, whether it's furniture or daylight or air fresheners or whatever. Thank so you, Paul, and we are just... actually out of time. That was a stern look. I know you guys didn't see that. 20 seconds. Okay, so we've heard show, we've heard tell, we've heard buy-in. I'm going to uh, give you a pitch for two more things. Embodiment. So we were talking offline about how we did this primordial spaces uh, embodiment activity with the teachers where, where we had them move furniture around, make it a cave, make it a campfire, make it a... Um, you know, a stage, and, and they, they were actually able to move and, and move the furniture around. So I'm very big on embodiment. You can't just see it, you can't just look at it, you can't just visit it, you have to experience it. After the design has been completed, that's when the work begins. So this is the nut that I tried to crack in my, in my master's thesis, was I was doing all these great workshops, I was doing disruptive, I was doing embodiment, and teachers still weren't taking up the challenge and moving towards the vision that we had all talked about. So I designed the 60 Minutes of Nature Challenge, which was just going into the, the, onto the site and saying, let's try this for five minutes. Let's try it for 10 minutes. Let's try it for 20 minutes. And if we're not willing to go to the post-occupancy end of the spectrum, all this beautiful stuff we do in pre-design doesn't have a chance of getting activated. And that's, I'll stop there. That's a great place to stop. Can we have a round of applause for our fabulous panel? <laughs> and huge thank you for One Workplace for hosting us in this fantastic space. We're hopefully all feeling a little bit better. Thank you to the online audience for making it 90 minutes with us. And uh, you, you can find the panel at the bar as soon as we close up here. <laughs>